Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to give you or present some results from some of the research we've been doing um, into tidal stream energy, and particularly in the, in the Shannon Estuary. So, the focus of the um, of our research was into tidal stream energy. Now, within that, we were looking at three particular aspects. Uh, firstly, in terms of um, quantifying the tidal energy resource and developing methodologies for that. Uh, secondly, to investigate the hydro-environmental impacts of energy extraction by tidal turbines. And that led in then to the, the third um, strand, which was looking at um, how to optimise array tidal farm configurations to minimise environmental impacts. So just to give you a flavour of what I've been talking about for the next um, 20 minutes or so, I'll just give you a quick introduction, a general overview of the types of impacts that we might expect from tidal turbines, um, the modelling approach that we've taken um, to include tidal turbines in our, in our tidal flow models, uh, then some details on the, the Shannon Estuary case study, um, looking at the resource assessment and how we quantify the resource within the estuary, and then the environmental impacts that we've uh, predicted based on putting an, uh, an actual farm in there. And in particular, we were interested there in looking at the effect of different spacings, employing different spacings between turbines and how sensitive the impacts were to those, to that change in spacing. So, um, there are lots of different designs around for tidal turbines. Um, at this stage, there's no clear winner. Uh, the tidal turbine industry is still in its infancy. Um, Lots of different designs on the left-hand side there. Um, from top to bottom, you have horizontal axis turbines, quite similar to wind turbines. You have vertical axis turbines below that. You have shrouded horizontal axis turbines, uh, making use of the Venturi effect. And on the bottom, then, you have hydrofoil, oscillating hydrofoils. So the most advanced, probably, at this stage are the horizontal axis turbines. Um, because of their similarity to the technology that's already been developed for um, wind turbines. They're quite similar to the, the uh, principles of operation to wind turbines. The first commercial scale deployment was in Ireland, in the north of Ireland, in Strangford Lock. Um, the CGEN device, 1.2 megawatt device, um, which has been generating away from 2009, um, feeding power into the grid and powering homes in Northern Ireland, in the Belfast area. That was developed by a, an English company, MCT, um, who've just been taken over by or bought out by Siemens. Um, the economic viability of these devices, while commercial deployments or deployments to date have only really been, sing been single devices, but the commercial application will be multiple devices in large farms similar to wind farms. When you have a single device in there, the impacts are minimal. But when you start putting in tens of these devices or even hundreds of these devices, um, as will be the case, then you, start to, you, can, you will start to see impacts on the flow regime and, and water levels. So that's particularly what we're interested in. Um, to give you a general overview of impacts, in terms of hydrodynamic impacts, by hydrodynamics we mean impacts on the, um, the flow and the water levels. So what you'll get is a, a reduction in current velocity downstream of the turbine due to the energy extraction process taking kinetic, ener kinetic energy out of the water. Um, all of the flow that would have gotten through this area previous to the turbine being deployed will not now be able to get through the turbine because of the reduction in flow speed and some of that flow will then be diverted around the device. So you get increases um, in current speeds around the devices. Um, you also get very nice pictures like this um, of the wakes of the turbines where you get um, generation of turbulence downstream of the device. And that can obviously have implications if you have uh, a turbine located downstream of a, another device, um, it would be interacting with the wake of that first device. All of those hydro hydrodynamic impacts then will have knock-on environmental impacts. Um, for example, changing flow velocities, where you get increased current speeds, you may have increased erosion rates where you get re reductions in current speeds, you may get increased deposition of suspended material from the water column. As Roger mentioned earlier, that can lead to increased light penetration and increased plant growth. Um, those erosion and sedimentation processes will affect the benthic communities on the seabed, um, 
possibly destroying some of the benthic communities there. Um, pollutant transport would, al would also be affected. The capacity of an estuary to transport pollutants from discharge points out to the open sea. So the self-cleansing potential of, a, of a, um, an estuary. Changing water levels then will also affect things like intertidal habitats. Some, you may lose some intertidal habitats and you may have reduced flood risk due to reducing high tide levels. Another important uh, impact outside of those, or, well it's a knock-on uh, from the uh, hydrodynamic impacts, is the power available that's available to a turbine for extraction. So when you start putting multiple devices in here, in, a, in an area, those devices will interact with each other. So the reduced velocity downstream of one turbine may be the resource that's available for the next turbine to extract from. And we can see here, uh, Inigo presented this equation uh, previously for wind energy. It's the same for, um, for water, uh, another moving fluid. The power that's available to a turbine is uh, proportional to the cube of the velocity. So any small error in estimation of that velocity will lead to a large error in your power estimations and your economic viability assessments for these farms. So that's another reason we're interested in um, the hydrodynamic impacts. So moving on then to modelling, how we went about modelling the turbines. There's lots of different approaches depending on the um, scale of resolution that you're interested in. So generally there are, there are two types of um, fluid dynamic models. There's near field models and far field models. Near field models in terms of turbines would be looking at device scale and sub device scale. So with these types of models, you're looking at uh, optimizing the design of the turbine, improving its, its uh, power extraction capabilities, reducing things like drag forces on the, the blades of the turbine. Far field modeling then takes the, those near field impacts and propagates them out into the far field to bay and estuary scales. And you're looking there at changes in flow regimes and uh, water levels. So the, uh, there are different ways of, of modeling then the mechanics of energy extraction. The one that we um, selected, which is appropriate for far field models, is the linear momentum actuated disk theory, um, which I'll just talk about briefly. Don't worry, I won't, go into, won't produce too many equations. Um, so the... Sorry, I think that's my phone, actually. <laughs> My timer's gone, so I might overrun now. <laughs> uh, so the uh, actuated this theory didn't power off, sorry, apologies. Um, actuated this theory is where we, instead of actually having a rotating turbine in, in the flow field, we simulate the turbine with a, a porous disc. So f fluid can get through that porous disc but the disc will exert a thrust force on the fluid. Um, and we can use that thrust force then as a, re, a momentum sink in our governing momentum equation. So we can take momentum out of the water based on the efficiency of the turbine. Um, we can apply that to open channel flow. So here we can see our, our thrust force um, applied by the disc on the uh, surrounding fluid. Now that can be calculated um, as being equivalent to the pressure difference being exerted by the fluid, by the surrounding fluid on the disc times the cross-sectional area of the, of the porous <coughs> disc or the, the turbine. So from that we end up with this expression here for the thrust force. And this is the force that we want to incorporate in our momentum equation. Um, with a similar derivation process we can derive the power equation. Um, and this uh, theory was first used by Albert Betts who came up with the, the Betts limit for turbines in flow fields. Um, where CP here is the, the efficiency of a turbine and he found that the, the maximum limit on the, that theoretical efficiency is 59.3% so you can't extract uh, any more power from the, from the um, water than that. So the thrust force here is proportional to the, the density of the fluid, the square of the fluid velocity upstream of the flow, not at the um, rotor itself, the cross-sectional area of the uh, turbine and um, this coefficient here which is the thrust coefficient which varies in response to the efficiency of the um, turbine and therefore the power takeoff. 
Um, an interesting feature here in constrained flows, uh, which doesn't apply to infinite flows for wind turbines, is that where you have a constrained flow, you, you could get a, uh, a drop in um, a change in water level, which we'll show later on for the Shannon. Now, I had to, in I had to include one real equation. Um, so this is the governing momentum equation. So what we've done here is included our, um, our retarding force, our, our turbine thrust force. We also include a drag force on the structure as well. Um, the turbine thrust force, uh, this is uh, resolved in the, in the x direction in our model domain. So we have an x and y direction in the model domain. Um, this is the x component of the turbine thrust. And the turbine thrust in a, in a grid cell depends on the number of turbines in there in that grid cell. So the thrust is applied over the, over the uh, cross-sectional area of the grid cell. So we can simulate multiple turbines within a single grid cell. So moving on to the Shannon Estuary then. Um, for our foreign uh, visitors, Shannon Estuary is located on the west coast of Ireland. Um, it's the longest, one of the longest estuaries in the, in the uh, British Isles. It's about 500 kilometres squared surface area, but 87 kilometres long, takes the water from the River Shannon out to the Atlantic Ocean. And because of its long, narrow shape, we can get currents in there uh, in excess of three metres per second. So it's suitable for uh, tidal energy extraction. So we've developed a numerical model of the Shannon Estuary. Um, before we started applying energy extraction, we had to validate that model, so just some um, uh, validation results here, comparing uh, the dots which are modelled current velocities to the solid lines which are measured current velocities for spring and neap tides. So you can see we've got good correlation there with measured data. Uh, so the model is resolved at 189 metres uh, grid spacing and it solves the governing equations every 20 seconds. So we get predictions of current velocities and water levels every 20 seconds of the simulation. This is just the variation of water depth throughout the model domain. Um, in terms of resource assessment, the general uh, approach to resource assessment is an averaging approach where, where you calculate the mean power that's available over a tidal cycle or over a spring neap tidal cycle um, or even over the course of a year. To do that, we use this equation here, which is, gives us the mean power. You can see it's quite similar to the uh, previous power equation. It's proportional to the cube of, in this case, the peak velocity recorded at a particular location or predicted by a model at a grid cell. Um, KS and KN are just shape functions which um, account for the variability of velocity over the course of a tidal cycle and over the course of a spring neap tidal cycle. So if we apply that to the Shannon, to each grid cell in the Shannon estuary, we come up with this resource map of the mean power. So you can see we have power availability there up to about six megawatts at particular grid cells. So these are obviously the locations here where we would want to deploy turbines. Um, we also get some added value from the model in terms of the variability of the current velocity and therefore the power output from a turbine over the course of a tidal cycle. Now if we look in a bit more detail at a particular location, say location A here, this is variation of current velocity, the black line, with current speed, sorry, with water level. So we're getting peak velocities at mid-flood and mid-ebb on our tidal cycle. If we look at directions then, so this would be our ebb tide um, predominantly in one direction out of the estuary and uh, predominantly in another direction for the flood tide. And the difference between those two directions is about 180 degrees. That's a perfect location for a tidal turbine. Tidal t most horizontal axis tidal turbines, their orientation is fixed. They don't swivel in response to the change in direction of flow. So what you, what you want to extract maximum power is to have your, the plane of your uh, swept area perpendicular to the direction of flow. If the difference in flood and ebb tides is 180 degrees, then both the flood and ebb tides will be intersecting that plane at right at, at 90 degrees. Now, if we look at a second location, location B, what we can see is that we don't get that 180 degree shift between flood and ebb tides. So therefore, if we uh, orientated our turbine to intersect the ebb tide at, right at 90 degrees, it won't be in place to intercept the flood tide at uh, 90 degrees. Now, another way of displaying velocities, current velocities, is in the form of a tidal ellipse. So if we just plot the current vector um, at a particular time, corresponding to this blue line here, we pick off the direction and the magnitude, we plot that. We can do that for different time intervals. 
we end up with that um, vector plot. We can draw an ellipse around that and we end up with what's called a tidal ellipse. So this is basically telling us that the direction of flow into and out of the estuary is predominantly along the major axis of this tidal ellipse. So we would want to place our turbine to intersect that um, major axis at right angles. If we take the semi-major axis and divide it by the semi-minor axis, for this quite thin tidal ellipse, we get a large ratio. If we plot a similar tidal ellipse for this second location, we get a much fatter tidal ellipse and a much smaller value or a much smaller ratio. So we want a high ratio um, of SMA to SMI. Now what we can do is plot that ratio throughout the estuary. So the, the red colours here are high values of that ratio. So these are locations where you get more or less a 180 degree shift in flood and ebb tides. So they're the locations that, where you want to place tur your turbines. And you have to tie that in then to your resource availability. On the bottom here, we just have the inclination of the semi-major axis. So again, that feeds into the, the uh, site um, configuration for these. So moving on to the hydro-environmental impacts then. What we did was we populated an area here with a high resource potential with tidal turbines. So just zooming in there. This is a, just a bathymetric plot. It shows the darker color are water depths that exceed 20 meters. Um, our, the turbines that we were deploying we were assuming a 16 meter turbine diameter, so we assumed that they could only be deployed in water depths greater than 20 meters. So within this dark blue area here, we, we populated each grid cell with tidal turbines at three different uh, spacings. So uh, quite a high density spacing, 0.5 times the rotor diameter, up to a low density spacing, five times the rotor diameter. And we compared all of those scenarios with the no turbine scenario. So looking at impacts and flow, sorry, first, just to go back here, we're going to compare results at S1 and S2, which are inside and outside the farm, and U1 and D1, which are downstream and upstream of the farm. So in terms of impacts and current velocities, the solid blue line here are velocities for the no turbine scenarios. So what we can see is inside the farm, we get reductions in velocities due to energy extraction. Outside the farm, we get increases in velocities due to the blockage effects of the turbines, of the turbine farm. And those um, increases are quite significant for the highest density turbine spacing and become more severe uh, for higher density spacings. Looking upstream and downstream of the farm, we can see that we get reductions in all cases in current velocities upstream and downstream. So what this is demonstrating is that the effects aren't just limited to the farm itself, they propagate upstream and downstream. We can look at spatial variations. So this is the, a velocity vector plot at mid-flood for the no turbine scenario you can see reductions in the vectors here for the highest density turbine spacing. We can look at relative, absolute difference and relative difference between those two vector plots. So the blue colors here are percentage increases and the red colors are percentage decreases. So we're getting up to 80% increases and decreases for the worst case scenario, the highest density field. Uh, coming back to tidal ellipses, you have ch you've changed the flow vectors, so you'll change the tidal ellipses. Um, so what we're showing here are, the, the contours here are the orientation of the semi-major axis. So you would want to deploy your turbines to intersect uh, at right angles to, to, to these inclinations. So you also want to analyze tidal ellipses when the farm is in place. Again, we can see for the lowest density turbine spacing, the, the ellipses are quite similar to the no turbine scenario. Moving on then to impacts on water levels, um, which are also quite interesting. Inside and outside the farm, we get, again, the solid blue line are water levels with no turbines in there. And then we have the other three scenarios. What we can see in all cases, we get a, 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 lowering, a lowering of the high tide level and an increase in the low tide level. So we get a reduction overall in the tidal range. Downstream of the farm, results actually, there's very little difference. Upstream of the farm, we get the same effects. So the, the effects only propagate upstream of the farm in terms of changes in water level, up towards the head of the estuary. Um, we then looked at the effects along the estuary. So we took nine different monitoring stations and looked at water levels at those stations. Um, this is, 
this shows the variation of water levels without any turbines in there. So what happens in estuaries is you get a natural distortion of the tidal wave as the wave propagates up the estuary. You get funneling of the wave, so you get an increase in tidal amplitude and you get a shortening of the flood limb of the um, tidal wave. So what we can see here is we're showing surface elevation. Um, these are high tide levels and low tide levels without the turbines in place. When we include the turbines, you can see that in all cases we get reductions in the high tide levels and increases in the low tide levels. And again, they're more severe for the higher, higher density uh, turbine farms. Sorry. Um, if we get, get the difference between those low and high tide levels, we get the tidal range. So again, you can see significant reductions in tidal range from the no turbine scenario to the worst case scenario here. Reductions of about two and a half. Uh, meters in tidal range. We'll come back to those later. Um, what, will, what also happens as the wave propagates up the estuary, energy has been taken out by friction, um, so the, waves, the speed of the wave slows down. So you get a, a high water occurring, high and low water occurring at later times as you move up along the estuary, naturally, without any turbines in there. When we put the turbines in, that delay, uh, those uh, high and low tide times are delayed even further by about two hours in the worst case scenario. So taking those hydrodynamic impacts and looking at potential environmental impacts then, um, what we did was looked at the effect on flushing characteristics. So the flushing characteristics of an estuary are basically the, the uh, capacity of that estuary to, to self-cleanse, to transport pollutants out of the estuary. Um, so what we can do is, one of, the, one of these characteristics is the residence time, and that's the average time that a water particle spends in a particular volume of water or a particular area of a water body in an estuary. Um, it's calculated using this remnant function here, which is basically we fill an area with, with dye in the estuary and we allow the, the tide to transport that dye in and out of, of, of the area. We plot the mass of dye at a particular time to the original mass of dye in that, in that uh, area of the water body and we get a remnant function. We can then integrate that uh, to get the residence time for that particular area of the estuary. So we filled the area, the extent of the turbine farm with a dye. We plotted our um, MT to M0 ratio, so we ended up with these remnant functions. From that, we could calculate residence times. And without the turbines in there, we found that the residence time was about 11, point, 11 and a half days. It increased in all cases for, for the three turbine uh, configurations, but the increase was most significant for the highest density spacing. So again, only a 1% increase for the lowest turbine density spacing in residence time. If we look at uh, the changes in water levels, then just upstream of the farm, we have an area here with extensive mud flats. These are specially protected areas. Um, if we look at the change in mud flats, the dark or sorry, the light brown colour here are the extent of the mud flats at low tide level without any turbines in there. The dark brown colours are the mud flats that would be left exposed in the worst case scenario if we, if we deploy the spacing of 0.5 times rotor diameter. So uh, a significant reduction in, in intertidal um, areas there and associated flora and fauna. So just to finish up with some conclusions. Um, I guess the, the big message here is that if turbine farms aren't planned correctly and uh, laid out correctly, you, there is potential there for significant impacts on uh, flow regimes and on water levels and knock-on impacts then on, um, in terms of environmental impacts. Um, the flow effects are particularly important for farm layout and yield estimates. The power is proportional to the Q with the velocity. So if we change that velocity in some way through energy extraction, we'll affect the power that's available to other turbines. Um, the hydrodynamic impacts can cause adverse environmental impacts in terms of um, changes in water levels, reduction of intertidal mudflats and changes in residence times. Key message, hydroenvironmental impacts are not confined to the farm. They will propagate outside the farm area. So you can't just limit your study to the farm itself. Um, the research has shown that the optimum spacing in terms of minimising hydroenvironmental impacts appears to be about five times the rotor diameter. And that ties in with some physical testing that we've done in, in, a in our tidal basin here at, the, uh, at NUIG. Um, just 
two other slides before I finish up, just to show you some other work that we're doing within Marin as well. We've developed a 3D um, energy extraction model, the, one that I, the results I showed you there from a 2D model. Um, so if you deploy a turbine that only extends through a part of the water column, it's going, it's, it's going to retard the velocities, or the velocities downstream of the turbine are just going to be retarded in that area, but they'll be increased above and below due to blockage effects. Um, so this could um, lead to maybe staggering the height of tidal turbines to intercept these accelerated flows above and below devices. So these are just for different percentage extraction rates. And we're currently applying that model to Shannon Estuary. Um, what we're also doing is looking at optimizing array configurations, not only for hydro minimizing hydro-environmental impacts, but maximizing power output. So we can, for a, a turbine farm like this, we can calculate the power that each turbine, the energy that each turbine will, will generate um, over a tidal cycle. You can see what's happening here is that the outer turbines are shielding the inner turbines. The inner turbines are located in the wakes of the outer turbines. So they're essentially extracting very little power and there would be a waste of money to put them in there. If you stagger the farm to make use of accelerated flows between uh, turbines, you can increase your array efficiency from 18% up to 48% of its theoretical efficiency. And we're currently doing some work on that in the Shannon Estuary as well. So I'll thank you for your time and leave it there. I've probably gone over time. You can blame my, whoever was trying to call me for that.